Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is our Wednesday evening Bible study. The church here gathers every Wednesday evening at 7 for Bible study. Normally that would be in our building at 2525 Archdale Drive, but because of COVID considerations, we meet here virtually by Facebook Live at the same time so that everyone can stay in the routine of Bible study. We should stay in our routines spiritually as much as we can. We gather for Bible study on Lord's Day morning. We gather for worship on Lord's Day morning. We gather for Lord's Day worship Sunday evening and also here on Wednesday night at 7. We should make sure that we continue to set aside this time for God. COVID is a very difficult situation, and it is many things. But one thing it is not is a vacation from serving our God. In fact, these times demand even more service to God more prayer to God, more love to God, more love for our fellow man. We must continue with all of our might to serve our Lord God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as our brother. On Wednesday nights, we are going through the Old Testament Bible in an introduction or a survey, if you please. And each Wednesday evening, we take a book of the Old Testament. Now, we are getting close to the end. And the end of the Old Testament, as it's published in our, our Bibles, the order, is exciting. Because even though books are shorter, they tend to speak more of the coming Savior than the older books do, even though they are larger. And it's so exciting to see the coming Christ in the minds and in the pens of the prophets. And we call these prophets the minor prophets, but as we've said, they are not minor except in size. But we want to tonight talk about a prophet that I don't know how to pronounce his name. It seems to me that the proper pronunciation would be Haggai. Most people pronounce it Haggai. My grandfather, my late grandfather, who was never wrong about anything, pronounced it Haggai. So, uh, there you have it. But, Haggai is one of the last prophets in the Old Testament, and his book is very short. It's only two chapters. But one thing about this particular book that excites me so much is it talks about one of the great heroes of the Old Testament, one that we don't even hardly think of or even recognize if you were to mention his name to most people they would say who i really don't know anything about this man that man is zerubbabel zerubbabel one of god's great heroes and he is so unique and we'll talk about his uniqueness when we get to the end of the book tonight it is amazing the uniqueness of zerubbabel he is in incredible, incredible company. Zerubbabel. He's one of those people that should be hanging on the wall of every church building in every Sunday school class. He's such a hero. But we want to talk about the book of 
Haggai. It's set in the days of the Medes and the Persians. Darius is the king. And Haggai is prophesying the future. The future is bright. It looks super. We should be as Haggai and look to the future with happiness and expectation. Because for a Christian, no matter what the future holds, the future holds Jesus. And he's preparing a place for us, his servants. And when he's done, he'll come and return for us. So, let's go to our Old Testament Bibles, to the book of Haggai. And we're going to go through the book tonight and see some wonderful things. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, again, there's only two chapters. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet to, here he is, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now you may remember the great pair of leaders that built the walls and the temple in Jerusalem at the return of the exiles, Ezra and Nehemiah. But there was a later team just as powerful and perhaps even more so. And that was the team of Zerubbabel and Joshua. Not the Joshua of antiquity. This is another Joshua. And as you recall, in Hebrew, Joshua is pronounced Yeshua. And in Greek, Joshua slash Yeshua is translated Yehus, Jesus. So what a powerful combination these two are, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say, The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you, yourselves, to dwell in your paneled houses? while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you have never enough. You drink, but you have not your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Here is the situation. Here is the situation. The exiles have returned to Jerusalem. And they've rebuilt the walls. And they've rebuilt the city gates. And they've built themselves some very, very fine homes down on the lake, so to speak. Panel houses. Ooh, pretty, pretty nice stuff. But yet they've neglected to complete, excuse me, the construction on the temple. And the Lord has come to Haggai the prophet, and he is the personal prophet, again, to Zerubbabel. And he says in verse 7, 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build a house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. I'm going to stop here for a minute. The principle that he's seeking here to convey is this, that when the people of God have a focus other than God himself, everything they attempt will fail. And that is a truism that you can take to the bank in this life. And that is if you fail to keep your eye on the Lord Jesus, then all that you do will come to naught, no matter what it is. Because at the end of our days, if we're not in Christ, then all that we've accomplished will be, as Jesus says, will be straw and burn up in the fire of judgment. And so he's telling the people, your priorities are wrong. And since your priorities are wrong, your results are disastrous. If you put God first, as we are promised by Christ himself, all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And now when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce, and I have called for a drought on the land and the hills and on the grain, the new wine, the oil of what the ground brings forth on man and beast and on all their labors. God is calling for disaster to come to the people if they don't repent. Is God wanting to punish the people just for arbitrary and entertaining reasons? Absolutely not. God loves his people and he disciplines them for their own good. He wants to get their attention. He wants them to understand that their priorities are upside down and therefore the blessings are upside down. And when priorities are righted, so will the blessings. Verse 12, there's now a break. This is refreshing because so often in the Old Testament, the people don't repent at all. But these people, Haggai got their attention with the words of the Lord. Verse 12, then Zerubbabel, there he is again, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. I want to stop there for a moment. We have mentioned this before. We'll mention it again. After the return of the exile from Babylon, Israel never ever had a king again. But this man Zerubbabel and his father Shealtiel were in the lineage of Christ. And had things have been different, they would have been in line to be king, both of them. But since there are no kings in Judah ever again, he's really called a governor. He's still the leader of the people, but he's not a king. It is also interesting and we'll talk more about this at the end, that both of these men 
Zerubbabel and his father Shealtiel are in the lineage of Jesus Christ. These men are the ancestors of Christ himself. And so it's important that we understand the good that they did. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. There is that I am. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. So the governor, the high priest, and all the people were stirred by the message of Haggai. Now we don't have his message, but it must have been a powerful one because it came from God, and it was 100% effective. We talked about not long ago with Jonah, had the most uh, successful sermon, perhaps in all of history. The entire city of Nineveh repented at his message, a message that he loathed to give to an audience that he hated. And yet the word of God is powerful, more powerful than any two-edged sword. And it was effective. Another sermon that is just as effective except on a smaller scale, is here. Now, we don't know how many people there were in Jerusalem at the time. It certainly wasn't the millions that we think of. We were, we're talking probably in the hundred of thousands or so. But the effect of Haggai's message was that it stirred up the governor, stirred up the high priest, and stirred up all the people to do God's will. And that's pretty powerful. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So what happened here? It's wonderful. The Lord gave his message to his prophet. The prophet gave the message to the governor. The prophet gave the message to the high priest. And he gave the message to all the people. And every man from the governor down heeded the clarion call of God's will. And they repented and obeyed the word of God and got the work done. Now we enter into the second chapter now. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, my priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? I'm reminded of the uh, the song, Glory Days. Don't remember who sings it. Don't remember any lyrics except Glory Days. Glory Days. Looking back in our past and saying, oh, man, back in the day, it was really something. Now, I'm going to have to um, beg your indulgence for a moment. I'm running out of power. And I'm going to have to go downstairs and look up to my power doors. So bear with me while I do. Talk as uh, we go.
Zerubbabel is a powerful leader. Joshua is a powerful spiritual high priest. And the people listen to their leaders. And they listen to the message of God. And they are doing exactly what God wants them to do. And as they are doing these things, God is asking them to remember something. Hey, is there anybody here that remembers the glory of the old Solomon Temple? He asked that question. Because there's a different perspective. Bear with me while I plug this in. I know this is a little uh, uh, unusual to do it this way, but hey, it sure be. Uh, sure be losing power, right? I think so. So here we are. Let me focus this again. There we are. So we're back here. So I want us to look at this. What's going on here? Verse th 3 of chapter 2. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong. Who? Who's to be strong? O oh, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord, be strong. O oh, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, be strong. All you people of the land, declares the Lord, work for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant I made with you when you came up out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. What a great message. It's certainly a message that resonates today. So many people are so afraid. Okay, I'm told that I am sideways. Someone has told me that I'm sideways. So uh, I am going to adjust this uh, thing here. Uh, my problem is that I have to leave this cord in and it, Okay, we'll see if this works here. We'll do it the best we can. I'm not sideways, but I am tilted. And I apologize, but I gotta leave this cord in. This is a powerful message. It reminds us of the first chapter of the book of Joshua where God comes to Joshua after Moses is dead and says, you're going to do what Moses didn't do. And I'm going to be with you. Be strong. Fear not. And this is the message that's consistent throughout the Bible. And Jesus is constantly telling us, fear not. Fear not. This is what God is telling Zerubbabel. It's what he's telling Joshua. And he's telling all the people. This building, you might think it's no big deal in your eyes, but it is. And you need to be strong and very courageous. Despite what you see with your eyes, God is at work. And so he is today. Do not doubt that God is working feverishly among us in these days of crisis and fear. And he's calling us 
as so many Zerubbabel's and Joshua's and says, don't be afraid. There's work to do. And if you do the, my work, I will take you where you so much want to go. And so, verse 6, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give you peace, declare the Lord of hosts. This came true in two ways. Most importantly, that temple in the first century was glorified to its utmost because God incarnate, Jesus Christ, walked its halls. And the light of God shone in that place perfectly. And not only that, it came true physically. Herod the evil Herod, he built that thing over 80 years. The Herod family built that temple, and it was so magnificent. It was so magnificent. It was said that if you stood on the Mount of Olives in the morning, east across the valley you could not even look at it because the gold and the silver reflected the sun's light to the point of near blindness it was an amazing place it reflected the glory of God who walked its halls those 33 years. Verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil of any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, No. Then Haggai said, If someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, It does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me. declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? 
Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. From this day on, I will bless you. Their priorities had changed. They abandoned taking care of their own houses, and now they're taking care of the house of the Lord. And so their fortunes are reversed because their priorities are straight. Now listen how the book ends. It's so exhilarating and magnificent. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and their horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Signet ring is the sign of authority. It is the way the king signs his documents. He takes the impression of that ring into the wet clay ta tablet and he does so. Now this is significant because Zerubbabel here is shown to be a type of Christ. Zerubbabel is in the same company as David. You recall that in the book of Ezekiel, God told the people through the prophet Ezekiel that David would come and sit on his throne. We understand that that is Christ. And Zerubbabel is used in the same way as David. David and Zerubbabel are types of Christ in that God is going to come and he's going to establish his kingdom through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is illustrated by David the king and by Zerubbabel the governor. Now we don't know much about Zerubbabel. But what we do know, that God had a special relationship with him. Because he says, I have chosen you. There's not many people in the Bible of whom God says, I have chosen you. Zerubbabel is one of those. What a great man. He and Joshua the priest rebuilt the re well what was impossible to rebuild and yet they did together they brought the people back into faithfulness after all these years of apostasy two men who listened to this prophet Haggai, who apparently, though we don't have his sermons, was a most powerful orator. One man who sways an entire nation to do a 180 degree turn. And we say, wow, that's incredible. We need to pray 
than in our time that God will raise up another Haggai, another Zerubbabel, and another Joshua to lead our nation out of its current morass. And what is required of the church in order for that to happen is that we remain obsessively faithful. Right now, God is not calling us to rest. He's calling us to war. A spiritual war. A war for the souls of men. And each one of us is integral in that struggle. Let us not ever forget that God can change a nation with just one man. He did it with Haggai. He did it with Zerubbabel. And he did it with Joshua. And he can do it again. God bless you, and we will see you tomorrow at noon for our Calling on the Name of the Lord virtual Bible correspondence course. Tomorrow at noon. Until then, God bless you.